Harvard professor Avi Loeb, Dr. Avi Loeb, he's joining us actually right now. Professor, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Good, Good to see you, sir. So yes. I, I, I know a lot has changed since the last time we spoke about 3i Atlas, but what are the biggest, biggest updates that uh, you want to share with us today? Well, several things. First, um, we were able, together with two of my colleagues, we were able to compile uh, 4,000 observations from 227 observatories around the globe of 3i Atlas, the way it moved across the sky. And we found that it did not deviate at all from a trajectory that is shaped by gravity. But that is a surprise because we know that it was losing 150 kilograms every second in the direction of the, sky, of the sun. We see that uh, from the image of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, that was taken on uh, July 21st. And the losing mass in a preferred direction uh, is supposed to push the object in the opposite direction. So there was a force acting on it as a result of its uh, evaporation, and uh, that did not introduce itself into the trajectory. So for that to be the case, the object needs to be very massive, so it doesn't care about that force. And uh, I calculated that it needs to be more massive than 33 billion tons. And uh, that means that at solid density, it needs to have a diameter bigger than five kilometers, uh, the width of Manhattan Island. Um, but that is just a lower limit. And the question is, what is the real size? And we hope to find out by the end of this week, because it will pass within 29 million kilometers from uh, Mars. And there are several orbiters around Mars that could take an image of it. One of them is the Mars Reconnaissance Ob Orbiter of NASA that has a, a camera called HiRISE that could take a, a high resolution image with a pixel size of 30 kilometers of this object. So the brightest pixel in that image will inform us about the surface area of 3i Atlas. And uh, just stay tuned. The, if The bigger it is, the more anomalous it is because there is not enough material to provide a rock of that size um, uh, once per decade from interstellar space. We know how much material there is per unit volume out there, and it would be really uh, anomalous the bigger it is. Uh, it's also a th at least a thousand times more massive than the previous interstellar object, uh, Borisov. Uh, and the question arises as to why didn't we see a thousand uh, objects the size of Borisov, which, you know, uh, was of order uh, twice the size of a football field. Uh, compare that to the size of Manhattan Island. You know, that's what the disparity we're talking about. And, and that makes uh, Three Eye Atlas anomalous. Now, in addition to that, uh, 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 there is also a report about uh, nickel around uh, that was shed by 3i Atlas and uh, without showing any uh, evidence for, um, for iron. And, and that is quite uh, uh, anomalous because usually nickel and iron come in uh, uh, similar quantities in, in comets. And the question is, uh, wh why is there mostly nickel? And, one possibility is that uh, you know nickel is much more abundant in industrial industrial production of nickel alloys, and so maybe wow. it is technological. Uh, but um, uh, finally, I should say that I, I noticed that um, um, the direction from where Three I Atlas came uh, is um, coincident with the direction of a radio signal that was discovered on uh, August 15th, 1977. The person who discovered it uh, wrote WOW next to the uh, discovery chart, and it's called the WOW signal. Uh, it was definitely extraterrestrial. We didn't know where it ca comes from. And uh, uh, the two directions of 3i Atlas and the signal from 1977 are aligned within nine degrees. So the chance of that happening at random is 0.6%. And the question arises as to whether 3i Atlas transmitted this wow signal. Uh, and I'm encouraging uh, any radio observatories to check whether there is any radio transmission from 3i Atlas. Uh, so far, we haven't had any reports. The other thing that I did uh, was write a letter 
to the United Nations, uh, encouraging them to establish a committee now that we are in a new era of uh, discovering interstellar objects. Uh, you know, the Rubin Observatory that was just inaugurated will is expected to find an interstellar object every few months. You know, we need a, an organization that is international, that looks at outliers, objects that have anomalies, and assesses whether any of them could be a threat uh, to humanity. Any of them might be technological in origin. Uh, such an organization does not exist. And I proposed establishing a committee that would look into that. Wow. Per, per, there's a lot to unpack. Per, so much. I love the uh, New York Times take on this. This is, we're going to need a bigger telescope, kind of <laughs> off the uh, Jaws movie yeah. line. Professor, just to make sure uh, I'm clear, inter, interstellar means it came from outside the solar system, right? Yes. And once it goes by Mars, is it, I don't know, heading in our direction then, or do we know oh. just yet? No. So during the month of October, so it comes closest to Mars on October 3rd, which is Friday this week in two days. Uh, and uh, uh, it will come within 29 million kilometers from Mars. And then it will approach uh, closer to the sun. Uh, the closest to the sun will uh, uh, time would be uh, October 29th. And then we won't be able to see it throughout uh, the month of October from Earth because uh, the Earth is on the opposite side of the sun. The sun is in between us and three I atlas and one wonders whether that was for a purpose you know the point of closest approach to the sun is usually uh, the best for getting gravitational assist from the sun if uh, the object wants to maneuver so we won't be able to see it doing any of that but if it comes on the other side of the sun in a different trajectory obviously you know the the stock market uh, uh, will crash because it would mean that you know it's not a rock uh, but uh, <laughs> but after that, uh, November, it will be visible to us during November. And actually, the closest uh, distance from Earth would be accomplished in um, uh, December. And then it comes close to Jupiter on March 16th, 2026. And after that, it's supposed to leave the solar system, as long as it will not maneuver. And another question, a related question, is whether, you know, if it's technological, uh, would it release any probes into the solar system that would mm. come close to the planets? And I asked my research team, uh, we have three observatories within the Galileo project that we put in uh, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Nevada. And uh, I asked them to monitor the data and see if there's any unusual activity uh, around Earth uh, in the months that follow uh, the, the closest approach of um, 3 I Atlas. Avi, I want to ask you real quick, uh, we've got a couple of minutes before we get a break, and if you could hang with us uh, for just a little bit longer. Uh, sure. But one of our viewers uh, said that, that they saw a headline today uh, about the object showing an extreme negative polarization. Yes. What does that mean? Well, in fact, I wrote about it a week ago. Um, it means that um, this uh, object has uh, the light that we see from its vicinity is polarized, you know, the way that uh, when you, you look on a hot day at an asphalt road, the, the, the light is polarized. That's why when you put sunglasses, you're blocking much of this light. So uh, the, 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 the question is, why is it so negatively polarized differently from uh, comets that we have seen before? And one possible reason for that is we uh, noticed in the Hubble image that there is a glow uh, towards the sun, a glow in front of the object, towards the sun, not behind the object, the way we see in cometary tails, where you have dust that gets pushed back and it's trailing the object away from the sun. Uh, these are the cometary tails that we are used to. But for 3 I Atlas, during the months of July and August, uh, we saw a glow that extends towards the sun. It was 10 times longer than it was wide. And my guess is that uh, when we detect the light from that uh, glow, that it's uh, unusually polarized because of this geometry of, uh, you know, it's, it's like having a cat with a tail coming from its forehead. And uh, <laughs> speaking, speaking about that, you know, just think about an animal coming to your backyard at night and, uh, you know, all the... People who look at the image say, oh, we see a tail, but you tell them, well, but this tail comes from the forehead. And moreover, the animal, and so they say, well, it 
it's probably a street cat, but you say, but the street cat has a tail coming from his rear end. And moreover, <laughs> this object, this object is a thousand, at least a thousand times more massive than the last uh, street cat that came over. And, you know, wow. so what, what is it? It's quite, and it's shedding nickel without iron. Yeah, that's all. Oh gosh. And, and it's visiting, uh, you know, in uh, coming close to assets in your backyard. So, so it's really, it could be a nightmare scenario. I call it also yeah. a, a, a black swan situation if, if it turns out to be technological. Your letter to the United Nations about organizing a committee for them to develop a plan of what will they do if this object turns out to be an alien intelligence that we need right. to take seriously. I, I think so, because uh, the intelligence agencies often prepare uh, plans, uh, contingency plans for black swan events that uh, might have a low probability, but uh, when they happen, you want to be prepared. And uh, in this case, you know, it could be a threat uh, to humanity that is uh, very different from uh, rocks falling from the sky. You know, that's what we are preparing ourselves uh, for, uh, knowing that the dinosaurs were killed by a, a, a giant asteroid. But you know, if, if there is a technological object approaching us, uh, all bets are off. It, it would behave very differently. And uh, just think about the uh, ants in the crack of a pavement looking up and, and seeing a biker that is passing by. The, 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 they would have a hard time conversing with the biker uh, or uh, uh, doing anything that would uh, change the path of the biker. And we might be in the same situation. And uh, we better uh, find uh, how we want to respond to different uh, scenarios. And of course, the, the devil is in the details. We, we need to know as much as possible about the other side before we decide what to do. It's not clear we can communicate with the other side. It's not clear we can protect ourselves, but we should be ready. And, and frankly, I think uh, such a, an encounter will bring humanity to a better place because um, as of now, we are just focusing most of our attention on a daily basis on conflicts here on earth. If there is a threat from the sky, it might bring people together because we are all in the same boat. Right. I, I want to ask you real quick, yeah. Professor, too, just to follow up on that. Do you feel like in the last few years when you are discussing this topic with business leaders, with world leaders in, in your communication, do, do you feel like the reception is a little more open than previously with the previous interstellar object, Momoa Moa, that they are a little more open to taking this potential threat more seriously than they were? Well, it's definitely true about the public because, uh, you know, I write uh, essays on medium.com on a daily basis. and. Uh, now, in one day, I get uh, as many views, you know, like uh, for the 60,000 views that I used to get uh, per month. Uh, and so that means the public really cares about it. I had a, a message from a, a former pilot in the U.S. Air Force who said that because of you, my daughter is now uh, interested in becoming a scientist. She saw you on television and she would like to do that. And so I think it's inspiring to young kids they find that science could be exciting. It's not uh, like sitting in a classroom and uh, listening to the lecturer telling us what we need to know. Instead, it's a, a work in progress and, and we collect data and evidence that will tell us what this object is. And the beauty of this is it's in we can see it unfolding in real time. And so I, you know, I do feel that the public definitely cares more about it. With respect to politicians, you know, it will take um, a real encounter that is verified to change the mindset of politicians or uh, people in the financial uh, markets, you know, because uh, such an event will have huge implications, potential implications. Once we... Uh, verify that we encountered alien technology, I think uh, we will start allocating a, a significant fraction of the budget we currently allocate to uh, uh, military uh, expenses. We will allocate it to space exploration. We would put a, a system of uh, uh, interceptors or, or probes that would alert the Earth uh, for any incoming um, uh, threat. Uh, you know, we will change the way we think about our place in the universe. It, it might inspire us to explore space much more than we do right now. So I think altogether it will have spiritual implications. It will have political, economic implications. I think it's a, an extremely important 
uh, uh, subject, um, but uh, people will not recognize it. Politicians will not pay attention to it until it actually happens for the first time. And <laughs> then everything will change. That's how humans are, aren't we? Right. Well, it's too late for me. You inspired me to sell all my 401k and just to start spending <laughs> it immediately. So thanks, th <laughs> thanks for that update. Dr. Loeb, we appreciate your time as always. And uh, Thank you, hopefully we can talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. Thank you.